Thank you for starting this conference on such a magnificent note of heart. Because I think that's the piece that has gone so dark in this past year particular, as people have lost heart or forgotten how to share it. And so I'm going to be sharing in some of these opening thoughts uh, a little bit of an ancient tradition that comes to us from the Christian tradition and, and that I've been at the better part of 10 years of trying to resurrect and as a matter of fact, excavate so we can see what's there. Uh, because I think that its reemergence not only fits into the general uh, trajectory of where this conference has been evolving to over the past decade, but is also of really crucial importance uh, as we as planetary citizens say, what are we going to do with our world? So anyway, I want to start with uh, the contemplative way of knowing is what the title of this talk is. And when people hear the word contemplation or contemplative nowadays, uh, they tend to register it as simply the Christian equivalent for what most of the rest of the world means by meditation. So that when people talk about doing a contemplative lifestyle, it, it means something to do with uh, stilling the mind, resting in the flow of consciousness, uh, not thinking, not pushing. This is certainly the spin that some of the modern Christian masters of contemplative prayer have put on it. People like Thomas Keating, who speak of contemplation as resting in God. And with the enormous recent recovery of, uh, relatively recent recovery, of really bona fide sitting meditation practices within Christianity, we have many, many people nowadays who see themselves as living a contemplative lifestyle or would call themselves contemplatives uh, because they manage to sit on a meditation cushion twice a day for 20 minutes or so. And this is all well and good compared to where the, the church may have been back in the time when you were fleeing from it, Maurizio. Uh, but uh, it does represent a substantial reductionism, or dumbing down, if you want to call it, of what was the original understanding of the term contemplation in the early centuries of Christianity and borrowed directly from the great philosophical tradition uh, of the Greeks before that. But the real meaning of contemplation uh, is not resting in stillness, but it designates a path of luminous knowledge knowledge of an extremely high order of intensity and coherence and magnitude. Uh, it's not content free by any means. It's simply that the content is so high and so ordered and so intense uh, and so brilliant that it tends to overwhelm the faculties of our usual rational mind uh, and the mind falls still and silent before it. One of the classic ways of, of describing this, because when some sort of an experience like this is actually experienced by people, the mind tends to fall silent and then goes stammering for words. Uh, so one of the classic definitions uh, uh, from about sixth century is contemplation is knowledge impregnated by love. Knowledge impregnated by love. Well, I don't know whether that clarifies or merely confuses. Uh, why love? Uh, this is really the mystery I want to explore with you this evening. Uh, why in the Christian tradition as a whole is it so stubbornly insistent on naming the chief operative in this higher order cognition as love. Are we talking here about the emotion of love? Affection? It would seem so if you read through the literature and look at the language used to describe this state 
over and over and over, the dominant metaphors for it are drawn from the, from the field of erotic love and even nuptial union. Uh, it seems as if God, the divine beloved, comes in his own inscrutable ways to draw the favored beloved into such a union of hearts and wills that all separation disappears. Understandably, over the course of time, this came to be looked on as a rare spiritual grace, way beyond the hope, let alone the, the, the struggle, uh, of any average seeker. So most seekers simply gave up on this contemplation as a knowledge, as a way of seeing far beyond anything they were going to touch in life. And in that sense, the teachings and the ancient practices that saw this not, not as a sort of mystical experience blown to the nth degree, but as a pathway of luminous knowledge, or if you might even want to call it that, a level of consciousness. The teachings that supported the moving toward that level of consciousness gradually dried up in the tradition and disappeared. And what you have left is this very, very hyped image of contemplation being something terribly high and terribly mystical and something filled with affective love. But I think there's a piece here that we need to pay attention to uh, that doesn't often come out in the, in, the, in the treatises and particularly in the way the Christian tradition delivers this path. Uh, and that is that it's, it's often, it's easy to dismiss the whole effusive nuptial language as a sign of perception still operating at a dualistic level. But I've actually come to believe that it contains a very, very different piece of information here. And when this piece of information is seen for what it actually is, it brings a very, very powerful and very, very needed piece to the table in our understanding of what non-duality is, what it is, how it functions, how it works. So there's a quote uh, from uh, the little prince, Le Petit Prince, uh, which everyone is very fond of. It is only with the heart that one can see rightly. What is essential is invisible to the eye. Well, this well-loved quote from the little prince is not only a wisdom teaching in its own right, it encapsulates, I believe, the very Christian experience of the non-dual. What if knowledge impregnated by love doesn't refer to the emotion of bliss or rapture, but rather knowledge centered in, seated in, and generated by the heart? Or more specifically, and as the ancient tradition was, was insisted upon saying, knowledge generated, knowledge attained when the mind is in the heart. And suppose this is not a metaphor, but an actual metaphoric description of a physiology of transformation a physiology of transformation that becomes understandable only when you finally come into our own era and begin to have tools like levels of consciousness to see what we're talking about. And once you begin, if you will allow me to get away with simply claiming as already proven my uh, assertion that contemplation is actually the closest equivalent in the Western Christian Experience Bank to what's known in most of the world as non-duality. If you let me get away with that assumption, and I'll say that that's what the first half of my book on the heart of centering prayer is all about, proving that. Uh, but if that's so, so that when you see the word contemplation in the various literature of the tradition, 
you're talking about the Christian languaging around the experience of the view from the level of non-duality. If you, if you can get away with that, then you will see that the absolutely key piece that the West has to bring to this dialogue is the insistence that non-duality is not possible. Steady, non-state, non-dual uh, perception is not possible until the mind is in the heart. Non-duality is not, in Christian experience, simply an extension of the cognitive mind or the cognitive line, i.e. the mind. Its signature feature is that the mind is in the heart. And this is both a physiology and an actual pathway of transformation. And what I'd like to do is just overview it a little bit in my thoughts tonight uh, to, to get it into the, to the dialogue, to set the frame for what we're doing. Then tomorrow I'm going to unpack the pieces and the actual practices that grow out of this in the workshop I'll be giving at 11. So the overview is this, and when I talk about it, you'll notice that I'm probably using the term in a little bit slippery way. I talk about the Christian experience, the West, the Christian West, the Christian East. Basically, there's a strain of the inner tradition in the West that may actually begin with Jesus in his famous sixth beatitude when he says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. There's a tradition of the heart as an organ of spiritual perception which flows through the esoteric tradi traditions of the West, uh, certainly reaching little peaks of particular intensity in the desert fathers and mothers of the fourth and fifth century, in the Eastern Orthodox mysticism, and then in a profound way that at some point buds off, I think, from that whole tradition, uh, in Sufism, which takes the traditions and the teachings of the heart that were the common language of this Western insight and develops them to a high, highly reformed art. So when I'm talking about this Western tradition, I'll be drawing on, uh, on insights from all of those traditions, perhaps most strongly, though, the Eastern Orthodox. So throughout this entire tradition, there's a strong propensity to identify the heart. And yes, I do mean the physical heart as an organ of spiritual perception. Uh, Throughout the, the early centuries of Christian monasticism, back at that time of the Desert Fathers and Mothers, this core insight that the heart has something to do with higher seeing is faithfully, faithfully transmitted together with an accompanying teaching that any fixation on particular thought forms, particular repetitive, associative, desire-ridden uh, patterns of thinking, logismoi, as the fourth century desert master Evagrius called them, uh, repetitive patterns, uh, results in triggering the passions. Passions being the disordered self-referential emotions, which in turn, quote, divide the heart catapulting the whole unfortunate practitioner out of the realm of luminous seeing and wholeness. Uh, the teaching was in turn passed on and developed even further in, in the Christian East and in Sufism. So the, the setup is simple, that the heart works in some way as a radiant mirror and magnifier of a truth, of a knowingness of a different order. And as long as it's whole, undivided, pure, as it's sometimes called, meaning undivided, it can do this. But as soon as it gets co-opted by what used to be to called in the tradition the passions, which means those tempestuous, fiery, stuck, 
emotions. The whole thing falls out of organ, orbit, and it loses its capacity for uh, seeing, which depends on a sort of clear, non-identified equanimity. So that's the teaching. And in the most profound renditions, the goal of learning to see with the heart is always a two-pronged process. The first is an active spiritual attitude of letting go, surrender of all attachments, both literal and psychological, and I think even ultimately perceptual to objects, to thought forms. Uh, as Simeon, the new theologian, an 11th century Greek Orthodox spiritual master, writes in his treatise on three methods of attention and prayer, he says, you should observe three things before all else. One, freedom from all cares, not only cares about bad and vain, but even about good things. Two, your conscience should be clear so that it denounces you in nothing. And three, you should have a complete absence of passionate attachment. Remember, passion means stuck emotion in this union. So that your thought inclines to nothing worldly. In other words, so that you don't get grabbed and reactive. So that's the practice that he lays out. In such a way, and only in such a way, he claims, is it possible to develop a capacity which he calls attention of the heart. A-T-T, -T, attention. Uh, the foundational prerequisite for actually being able to follow the teachings of Christ. In the heart of centering prayer, I show how he implicitly recognizes that these teachings, these Christic teachings, emerge from a much higher level of consciousness than the ordinary mind can sustain or comprehend. It takes a contemplative mind to comprehend these teachings. And as Simeon says flat out, if you don't have your mind in your heart, if you don't have attention in the heart, it is impossible to do the Beatitudes. It is impossible even to understand them. Uh, so, and again, putting that back into current modern levels of levels of consciousness, he's basically saying that the Christ teaching comes from a non-dual level. And you can't run it when you're running a non-dual program, or when you're running a, a dualistic program. I give you the religious right. Uh, it requires this high state of attainment, and what Simeon in this tradition says is the linchpin of that is the mind is in the heart. But lest you get the impression that attention of the heart is merely a spiritual attitude, uh, its companion teaching, the putting the mind in the heart, makes it clear that something much more embodied is being envisioned here. While this veritable mantra of the Eastern Orthodox tradition might be merely misconstrued as, uh, as advocating emotion over thinking, let's put the mind in the heart, let's feel our way, uh, it's clear from the texts themselves that putting the mind in the heart is not merely or even at all a devotional attitude. It's accompanied in these texts by specific instructions on concentrating and holding attention in the region of the chest, uh, affecting what contemporary neuroscience would more typically describe as an entraining of the brain waves to the rhythms of the heart. Uh, so that putting the mind in the heart collecting sensation in the heart, a term that was in its own days referred to as vigilance or nepsis. Nowadays, nowadays is often understood to be meaning thinking nervously about the heart. But it was clear, the text again and again describe bringing warmth, bring it down, collecting sensation in the region of the text, 
holding it as the exact embodied uh, accompanying practice to an attitude of letting go of identifications, passions, uh, issues, agendas. Uh, attention of the heart is not merely a metaphor. It denotes a whole new physiology of perception without which permanent non-dual attainment is impossible. And Simeon was saying this in so many words back in the 11th century. Uh, so I want to make very, very clear that this awareness is not absent in the Asian traditions. Uh, I vividly recall the story of a Buddhist master being asked how he had arrived at some spiritual insight. My mind tells me, he says, pointing to his heart. Uh, uh, it may very well be that the Asian masters would simply never have conceived of separating mind and heart in the first place. Uh, but in the Western traditions and in the Western translations of Asian texts, this nuance does not reliably come through, resulting in many maps such as Ken Wilber's influential levels of consciousness, which support the inference that the third tier or non-dual consciousness rests squarely on second tier uh, or mental rational and hence is merely an extension of the cognitive mind uh, into higher and higher realms of spiritual experience. The Western maps properly interpreted make clear why this can never be so that the maps again and again and again say that if you're going to run the non-dual program of perception, one of the basic physiological requirements for it is that the whole thing is entrained to, to the heart and to the specific mode of perception of the heart, which is what I'm about to get into as I look at this other thing, the 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 sensate experience of mind in the heart, I think, is actually the principal explanation for Christianity's stubborn attachment to the realm of the personal. And I know this is very frustrating for many people, uh, many Christians, that you'll often heard it said in non-dual circles that the non-dual is non-personal. And that, and that access to the non-dual realms requires moving beyond the personal. And Christianity's stubborn attachment to the language of love and adoration and God and the beloved is often taken as a sign of a religion operating at a lower level of consciousness, certainly still wedded to its personal view of God and not yet fully launched into the transpersonal. But I think something else is at stake and it becomes really, really clear once again when you, when you pick up with this idea of attention of the heart and experience it uh, phenomenologically. In other words, what actually happens when you collect attention through sensation in the region of your heart. And a warning right from the start, this is not an easy spiritual exercise. You can't just say, boom, I'm going to put my attention in the heart. You'll wind up either going to visualizing, which is thinking about what I learned about the heart in high school biology, or you'll go to emotivity like trying to jumpstart a feeling by thinking of a time you were happy or when you were sad. This is very, very different from collecting sensation in the heart, which means a finely honed capacity to hold attention. We often start by putting our attention on the hand, just so you can begin to enliven a part of your body with sensation. It's amazing when you learn to do it. But to bring that same thing into an inner organ takes a good deal of spiritual practice and attention. But if and when you learn to do it so that you can enter the cave of the heart through sensation, what awaits you 
as a as the feeling tone that begins to emerge out of that is actually quite remarkable. Intimacy. When the view, when your, when your attention is gathered in the heart, the experience is of pure intimacy, objectless intimacy, radiant intimacy that exudes out from the core of the heart without the need of an object to attract it. I remember bumping into the hem of that once in my practice of centering prayer and feeling just blown away by this golden warm tenderness that was just there, just coiled in the heart, resting. I said, all these years I've wasted seeking for for intimacy in a relationship. <laughs> it's like Dorothy at the end of the Wizard of Oz, the little red shoe that would carry you home is on your feet all the time. But to sit in the sensate feel of the heart and try to take that and, and find the nearest feeling tone that matches it, intimacy. Intimacy is what it feels like to, uh, to look at the world from the point of view of mind in heart consciousness. And I think this is really important, and as I come down to a few concluding words here, I'd like to raise for your consideration the fact that Christianity's stubborn attachment to the language of the personal, and of course in almost all religions too, you have this bhakti tradition, it isn't unique here. Uh, it, it has nothing to do with projections onto big da daddy in the sky of egoic pain and pleasure. Rather, it has to do with the fact that every genuine insight and teaching that has ever been generated in Christianity or any other tradition has been generated in the heart. That is to say, under the species of intimacy. This is how and where mystical perception actually occurs, at least according to the unanimous testimony of the West. And the language, the nuptial romance language, simply bears witness to the place of origin. It's a way of authenticating that, that divine revelation transpi transpires within the domain of heart under its Aegis and agency, making connections not through the cooler logic of metaphysics, but the warmer language of vulnerability, surrender, intimacy, and gendering. And this leads me directly to the final point that I'd like to raise and leave with you tonight. Uh, and that's that the nature of heart seeing is that it's intrinsically moral. Uh, this is not because of what it sees, but how it sees. Because the heart perceives through essentially, if you want to put it in the most scientific sense, uh, through sympathetic resonance or sympathetic vibration by uh, by bringing vibrations into alignment. It's not a kind of divide and conquer mechanism that the rational mind uses, but more a kind of way of feeling the whole field like a holistic sonar. So that means that by the very process by which the mind, by which the heart sees it all, it sees from a sense of coherence, intimacy, and belongingness. It feels the big picture. It feels the weight and balance of the whole. Uh, and so if what projected outward, what we feel inwardly is that sense of intimacy, becomes, when thrown out to the world, the seat of cosmic compassion. So heart perception is by nature holistic and compassionate. It sees the world as one, weighs the pieces, touches the pieces, 
One of the reasons why the tradition has always insisted that your conscience has to be clear in order to really have heart perception is because your conscience is the eye of the heart in a deep way that sees, that connects. Uh, so certainly with the mind, the mind there can be such a thing uh, as arrogant attainment, but not with the heart because all those emotions such as pride, vainglory, will to power, domination, uh, are specifically the things enumerated in the ancient tradition that divide the heart and therefore make it incapable of luminous seeing. So, in fact, in the French language, the words for conscience and consciousness are the same word. La conscience. Uh, and I think that's really important. Uh, you cannot, in this tradition, be conscious and arrogant. You just can't do it because it's only with the heart that one sees rightly. So the very practices by which one becomes a generous human being, a compassionate human being, a compassionately engaged human being are also the practices by which, as the eye of the heart opens, the luminous knowledge becomes more and more the knowledge that we're using to test and feel and transform the world. And I think that in our own era right now, at the place we're standing, that's a crucially important piece to put back onto the drawing board and onto the table as our transformation, uh, for our transformation and continued evolution as human beings. So I think that's enough to, to get this launch tonight. As I say, if you want to look a little bit more about the practices and break them, uh, break them down, I'm going to go through some of the practices that support some of this heart emergence tomorrow, uh, you can come to that, that workshop if you can find it. Uh, but what do you think? Is that enough, my beloved gurus, for the <laughs> to launch us for tonight? It's your call. Okay, I'd say this is good? Yes. Good. Yeah, terrific. Thank you.